kind of bring together different perspectives on that, different struggles that have been going on in universities, thinking about how we can connect those. Um, um, yeah, just to go into the training center. Yeah. How long am I going to be looking at the training center? That's the thing that's going to be looking at. Okay. Um. <laughs> <laughs> no, is it, is it okay? Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, I'm going to talk a bit about the, uh, the USS dispute, the University Superannuation Scheme, which is quite a dry and dull uh, name for the body that uh, 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 governs and oversees uh, pensions for uh, university uh, workers uh, of a certain kind in a certain kind of university, that, and that in particular that's the old universities, the pre-92 uh, universities. Um, uh, and behind the, the rather dry USS uh, strike uh, uh, title, there's a really, really interesting and really, really exciting set of, of events. Um, but it's a set of events that I think that we're, all of us who have been involved in it in one way or another are still trying to uh, figure out what happened, what went wrong, what went right, what can we do next, because it's still an ongoing and live um, issue, but I'll, I'll start by sort of going quite a long way back to talk about some of the, the background to how the, 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 the strike um, emerged. Um, and in fact, I want to go back to before the UCU even properly existed, to go back to 2006. Um, back in 2006, AUT, uh, the old association of university teachers in NACBI, who were the EPI um, uh, uh, union, uh, were in the process of merging. And uh, a dispute emerged in 2006 uh, that was in response to a very, very long, long term decline in uh, academic salaries, which uh, one uh, uh, assessment put at about 40%. Um, over the course of 20 years. Um, and it was the first time uh, that academics uh, nationally, correct me if I'm wrong here, uh, nationally uh, uh, taken unified collective action um, over, uh, over pay. They'd been offered 12.6% uh, pay increase over three years, uh, and it was rejected, and the demand was put into 23%. Uh, uh, a counter-off was put in by the employers of 13%, 13.1%, which was deemed unacceptable. Uh, and then there was industrial action, um, uh, a very successful ballot for industrial action. Um, and after the industrial action, a deal was made with employers that amounted to 13.13%. Um, if that sounds a bit ridiculous, <laughs> then that kind of lays the basis for understanding just how demoralized and how uh, difficult things have been, I think, over the questions of pay and pensions um, uh, amongst lecturers over a, 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 a long time. Um, the 2009 pay round uh, was similarly disastrous. And then, of course, we had in 2010, with the, the, the election of the coalition government, the attempt to really seriously pushed through a cap on wages uh, and, and a cap on pay increase and that was reflected in uh, the university sector uh, and between uh, 2010 and 2016 uh, there was a real terms pay cut amounting to about 15 to 20 percent depending upon where you were so this is just a, a just an idea of where where things were when 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 the strike breaks out but another part of the background that I think is important to understand in the strike is 2010 uh, and looking at what happened in 2010 around the student uh, revolt, the student protest movement, uh, in part because it raised a lot of really big uh, political issues about uh, campuses, about uh, marketization of education, uh, uh, discussions and arguments and movements uh, that uh, emerged during 2010 rumbled on, sometimes in the open and sometimes subterranean, subterraneously, uh, for, for, for years afterwards. But also what was very important about 
2010 is that it radicalized a layer of students who found themselves uh, this year and last year when the, the, in the build-up to the strike uh, as uh, often precariously employed uh, teaching assistants or early career academics who had been radicalized in 2010 and carried a lot of the legacy of 2010 uh, with them. Uh, the strikes then uh, uh, this year were over uh, pensions. They were over a very particular aspect of, of pensions in one way, which was the move from what's called a, dis uh, a defined benefit scheme, whereby you, you have a particular uh, amount of pension that is related to your service and related to what you paid in to the pension pot. And the proposal from the employers was that there is now a deficit in the fund. This is something that's been challenged repeatedly um, methodologically and empirically, um, uh, and that therefore it needs to change to something that's called the defined contribution scheme. And this is something that links your final pension uh, not to service or contributions, but to stock market performance. And effectively, it's a way of shifting the risk from a collective institutional risk to the risk being held by individuals. This was seen as something that was completely unacceptable. The UCU's own calculation said that it would leave the average university lecturer around £10,000 a year worse off. But you can imagine that for early career lecturers, and particularly uh, uh, women lecturers and BME lecturers, uh, where there's a clear pay gap, uh, it would be disproportionately, they'd be disproportionately impacted um, by it. So that's the, those are the, that's the, the real impetus for what started the strike. But of course, as well, all of the, the arguments, the debates, the discussions that had emerged prior to and after 2010 about the kind of campuses that we wanted to see, the kind of governance that we wanted to see, fed into a lot of the, of, of the anger that was going on there. And so the lead up to the strike was the left in the union, and there's a very confusing arrangement in the union where you have the UCU left, who are the left, I mean at an institutional uh, level, uh, and you have the independent broad left, who are the right. Um, um, and there was a serious argument, a, a, quite a serious fight over whether or not uh, industrial action was viable uh, or desirable. Um, and people affiliated to the UCU left um, were able to take advantage of Congress last year, were able to pass motions that allowed them to get into branches to start putting arguments for the strike. Uh, and crucially, they were able to peel to a certain extent uh, Sally Hunt and sections of the bureaucracy away from the IBL pessimistic position and towards the idea that a strike um, was uh, would, would be uh, essential for defending uh, the, the pension scheme. Um, and the pension uh, ballot, when it finally came around, in an interesting way, was assisted by the Tory um, by the Tory policy because the Tories introduced a policy that said for, uh, for the strikes to go ahead, there would have to be a 50% turnout for that ballot to be valid. And that meant that the UCU had to really throw a lot into mobilizing to get those votes. Whether or not it wanted to call strike action at first, it needed to get those ballots in order to have a bargaining chip. And in order to do that, it needed to seriously mobilize and put a lot of uh, effort into getting a, a, a good turnout. And in the event, there was a very good turnout of 58% across the sector with an 88% vote uh, for strike action. Um, and that was, an, that I think that for a lot of us, that took us kind of by surprise. We weren't expecting that high um, a, 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 a section of the respondents to vote for the strike action. Um, what happened next uh, it was, quite, was also quite a surprise, which is that there was an announcement of 14 days of strike action smack bang in the middle of the spring term, one of the busiest periods and one of the most disruptive periods um, of the year. And there was a lot of debate about whether or not that was realistic or whether or not it would happen. There's a lot of discussion about whether or not UCU ever thought that it would have to happen or how much of it they thought would have to happen. But it was a clear sign from the union, whether or not it was intended, that they were up for a real fight. And I think that that really gave activists in branches, on campuses, the confidence to go and put arguments for mobilizing for the picket lines, for really organizing in our departments, for organizing for a serious, um, for a serious fight. 
Uh, and in fact, what happened, uh, whether or not they expected UK and USS to come back and say, look, we'll make a deal, what happened was that the strike began with an unprecedented level of engagement. Huge numbers of people coming out that first day. I remember being at Queen Mary on that first day in absolute sub-zero <laughs> temperatures, wearing my thermals um, under my jeans, uh, uh, and well over 100 pickets spread over multiple picket lines, um, and an enormous amount of creativity that uh, was something that I had I'd never really been involved in a sustained industrial action like this ever before. And the creativity was astonishing, you know, the banners, the, the songs, you know, adapting songs like Share, Do You Believe in Life After Love, became, Do You Believe in Life After Work, and all kinds of, all kinds of things like that. But not just, not just like that, that kind of thing, but the sense of people taking control of the strike. New layers of people who hadn't really been involved in the branches before, who'd certainly never been elected to any committees or taken up any casework, were organizing in their departments. Um, in my own department, uh, we had a huge involvement of TAs who were actually proportionally losing a significantly higher amount of their income. And, you know, for many of them weren't even really optimistic about ever getting a pension at all, but were very, very involved. We were organizing ourselves to get delegations out uh, to the picket lines, um, and it was an incredibly uh, exciting uh, period. On campus as well, a huge sense of anger at our own management for refusing to come out and back the strike and to say that it was going to support uh, the workers. Uh, and an incredible sense um, of being betrayed by a management that advertises itself as being this very socially responsible um, and socially interested um, body. And as the strike moved on and ground on, another incredibly important aspect of what was going on was the incredible amount of student support. The idea was that students were now consumers, they were paying an enormous amount of money in fees, and therefore they were going to turn on their lecturers. Instead, what we saw on the eve of the election was that just 2% of students thought that university staff were most to blame for the, for the dispute. 61% of students said they supported the strike, and in the students where staff were striking, rather than dropping off, it was even higher. In students where the staff were on strike, it was 66%. This really upset the apple cart of what I think the employers were expecting uh, from the strike, and it led to uh, people feeling much more confident. It led to huge mobilizations in central London where students were marching alongside their lecturers. I remember sitting through what was an incredibly bureaucratic and, you know, kind of, you know, in some ways really annoying student union meeting uh, at, at QMUL, because obviously I'm a PhD student, so I could go, where uh, we had put in a motion of support. There was a lot of uncertainty about what was going to happen, and there were around 200 or so people in the room, and in the end only three people voted against the motion. So this was an enormous level um, of support, and you could really see the extent to which uh, organization was developing on the picket line. You could see the extent to which teach-outs um, were bringing new layers of people into discussion. Uh, and crucially as well, I think, uh, in a way that I hadn't really seen it in any other strike, you could see the way that online discussions, and particularly um, a Facebook group that was set up, I think it was set up by like people around the notes from below um, uh, uh, journal, uh, was able to coordinate over a thousand people all across uh, the country in developing ideas, sharing, I sharing memes, sharing strategies, uh, and an enormous amount of coordination. And that became incredibly crucial at a very important point during the strike when the, uh, the UCU leadership uh, and, the, uh, and the employers announced that they had come to uh, an agreement that they were going to put to members. And this was a an agreement that was certainly an advance from what we had been offered, but it wasn't a tremendous advance. And it certainly wasn't the kind of advance that a mobilized, active rank and file were likely to accept. And what we saw very quickly was uh, in the evening that it was announced, the no capitulation hashtag started to trend on Twitter. You had a, a petition that by the end of the night was signed by over 5,000 people. 
And crucially, you had a mobilization outside UCU headquarters the next day, where branch reps were meeting and the HEC, the executive, were going to meet where certainly in London, we were able to have meetings on our picket lines and then move those pickets to the headquarters. Around the country, you heard reports of mass pickets, uh, of mass meetings of hundreds of people. In Manchester, I think 420 people unanimously voting to reject it. All of the, almost all of the branches announced that they were gonna reject it. And in the end, the, um, the proposal was not even put before the HEC. And we were able to go back uh, to the pickets and say that it was off the table. In some ways, I think that was the high point of what happened. That was the high point of the mobilization because what became clear after that was that the question of strategy and the question of what we do next really loomed over us. There was no clear sense of what it was that we were able to do next. The strike was about to end, and so we said that we were going to have branch, emergency branch meetings very soon afterwards. We had the emergency branch meetings, in Queen Mary, and I think in different parts of the country, they were very well attended, but again, there was a real uncertainty about what we were going to do. And then you had the announcement of another deal. This time the deal, there's been a lot of argument, there's been a lot of debate about what that deal represented. Um, for, uh, the deal basically said that instead of having one of these uh, agreements imposed upon us, instead, how long have I been talking for? <laughs> Oh, okay. I'll wrap up very quickly. The deal, there's a lot of debate about the deal. It took the, the proposals off the table and suggested a joint expert panel. Again, people weren't generally, the activists weren't generally happy about this and weren't uh, prepared to accept it. And yet, in the absence of a mobilized rank and file, in the absence of a, an ongoing space where we were able to debate and thrash out ideas and able to mobilize uh, in order to do something about it, what happened was that the bureaucracy were able to launch an e-ballot, which was able to go over the heads of that activist uh, core that had been formed during the strike and that had solidified during the strike and was able to instead appeal to people who may have supported the strike I I initially but were prepared now to say, I think this is a good enough advance. It was also able to appeal to people who had never supported the strike and because it was an e-ballot, all you had to do was click a button, it was much easier to vote. So in fact, the turnout was higher in the e-ballot than it was in the ballot for strike action. And so it was no surprise that actually about two-thirds of people voted to support it. I don't think that it was a ringing endorsement of saying, this is a brilliant result. I think it was a reflection of the fact that for some people, they thought that we weren't going to be able to maintain any uh, effective strike action during the exams. There were a lot of arguments about what to do. And out of that, a campaign did emerge to say we're going to campaign, for, so a, a campaign against uh, accepting that. And I think that that campaign was very effective, actually, to be able to mobilize as much of a vote against the, 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 the deal as it did. I want to very, very quickly move on because I've run out of time. But out of that, we have had a rank and file um, meeting that brought together about 70 activists from all around the country from different um, universities. The UCU left organized a very well attended, very successful day school um, at the end of June. And of course, perhaps other people will talk about this, there was the UCU Congress last week where motions that had been brought uh, calling on the General Secretary to resign over her behavior and springing that um, ballot in a very, un, what we thought was a very unfair and un and democratic way of doing it at short notice when there was no uh, ability for an opposing view to be put. Um, rather than taking on those arguments, getting up and putting her case, instead the university, the union staff walked out and said that this was an unfair attack on a university, uh, on a union employee. They said that, the, that Sally Hunt was an employee rather than a representative and said that this was unfair on her terms and conditions. Out of that, you do have the beginnings now of, uh, of a possible coming together of people who are involved in UCU left, from the rank and file, uh, from the UCU briefs, which was, a, which was a, an online thing that put together discussion papers and this, uh, uh, about what was going on during the strike. And all of these point towards the possibility of organizing for what comes, ahead, what comes next. The question of what comes next, though, I think is going to be a real point of argument whether it's trying to get Sally Hunt 
to resign, whether it's to get uh, a big mobilization for the, for the pay dispute that's coming up in the autumn. I think that the, the crucial thing is that we need to organize to say that there will be a recall conference, there is going to be a recall conference uh, in the next month, that the motions calling for Sally Hunt to be censured or to resign should be heard on principle, they should not be uh, bureaucratic, bureaucratically obstructing from being heard. But critically, I think that what we need to be doing is saying that we saw that our strength was when the rank and file was mobilized, and we need to be using the preparations for a pay dispute over the insulting 2% pay offer that's been made uh, to mobilize once again for, an, for a vote for action uh, and for that action to successfully re-energize the rank and file and for us to revisit that question of how we maintain those structures. We need to be building on campuses and bringing a lot of those new layers uh, of people into activity, into organizing for that strike. Sorry, I'll leave it there.